So no, let, let's start now because it, it's, uh, it's time. Two thirty. It's, it's time. I start and then you continue. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my colleague and guy, Professor uh, Yim, who is from South Korea, uh, and me, Gerard Rambulamana. I'm the head of the, uh, no, chief uh, of the CBT section within the PTS. Okay, good afternoon everybody. And then today we'll have uh, four presentations. Today, uh, Professor Yim, he will lead the session and then let's ask the first person on that. But don't forget that the, the, uh, the objective of this uh, uh, session is about the uh, capacity building training and then awareness for the public. So let's focus on that and then after this we will have the time to uh, raise your questions to the, the presenters. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Man Sung Im again. Uh, first speaker will be Ms. Noor Jan from Kazakhstan. She's currently working here in Europe, working on some of the non-perfection issues, uh, European initiatives. She will be talking about that. Her title, a talk, a title of a talk will be CTBT and role of, uh, I guess, CTBT young generation in the Korean peace and denuclearization process. Ms. Nuljan. Uh, 
Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, my name is Marjan, and I'm from Kazakhstan, and I represent. Just to, to remember that we have 10 minutes of presentations and five, five minutes of, of questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank Good. you. Uh, I represent a couple of organizations and I would like just to name some of them. Uh, so I am a regional coordinator for uh, the organization called Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. Uh, I'm also a convener of Abolition 2000 Youth Network. Uh, I am a member of CTBTO Youth Group. Uh, and I'm also a member of the global campaign called Move the Nuclear Weapons Money. And uh, I just would like to remark from the very beginning that my focus will be more on uh, CTBTO youth group involvement. Uh, and I do not claim to be an expert in uh, North Korean issues. But I have had some experience uh, this year in February, which I'm going also to uh, speak about in my um, presentation. So first of all, it's an honor and pleasure for me to be um, invited to this panel and have opportunity to speak about the important issue of uh, Korean peace process and denuclearization, as well as involvement of young people in this topic. Um, the, the nuclear crisis in the Korean Peninsula is a long-standing problematic issue, which constitutes a threat and challenge to the regional and global peace and security. DPRK's nuclear tests have demonstrated that increasing technical capacity of their nuclear weapons program uh, served uh, as an act of provocation and conflict escalation. Conversely, <coughs> the recent uh, steps by DPRK to place a moratorium on nuclear testing and destroy a nuclear testing facility uh, served as a confidence building measures which have helped the inter-Korean peace process. However, this was uh, already changing a bit. The abstract was submitted before the recent events. Um, however, these steps uh, have not been sufficient to overcome suspicions from the side of the United States or, or the international community regarding the intentions of uh, DPRK with regard to their nuclear weapons program, um, nor to free up the blocks um, in the DPRK-US process. Further progress uh, by DPRK to verifiably proscribe uh, nuclear testing would be of enormous benefit to the diplomatic processes and serve as an incremental uh, steps towards full de uh, denuclearization. I come from a country uh, which, as a part of the Soviet Union, um, was supposed to be defended uh, by nuclear weapons and experienced nuclear tests, but is now a champion for the CTBT uh, and a member of regional nuclear weapon free zone known as Central Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone uh, and a supporter of a global disarmament uh, initiatives. I believe that DPRK will also be able to move uh, from its current reliance on nuclear weapons and nuclear tests and join the Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone and support global disarmament uh, actions. However, this is not going to be easy and it will require a lot of diplomacy and uh, reconciliation in order to move from an adversarial, adversarial regional framework to one of peace and cooperation. In order to succeed, uh, the mix of political, uh, cultural, technical, and social um, measures will need to be required. The CTBT uh, can make an important contribution to this process, uh, and the CTBTO youth group uh, can play an important role, uh, and I would like to mention some of the um, possible um, suggestions, how CTBTO youth group members can be active for the Korean peace process. So first of all, uh, CTBTO Youth Group is comprising uh, 700 um, students and young professionals uh, coming from around um, 90 countries. Uh, however, if we look statistically to the um, numbers of young people or young professionals coming from Korean Peninsula, it's all equal only to nine or 10 individuals, uh, which is very low. Therefore, uh, we could uh, increase the number of uh, participants from the Korean Peninsula. And uh, speaking from my own experience, uh, we uh, have had um, two CTBTO youth group international conferences. First one was happening in Moscow in 2017, and the second one took place in Kazakhstan in 2018. And uh, for the next year, for example, the CTBTO Youth Group International Conference could take place 
uh, in South Korea, and by this we could attract more young people and raise awareness about the CTBT uh, and CTBTO youth group. And in order to involve uh, more public, it's essential to inform through peace education. Initially, considering uh, lack of knowledge and sufficient coverage uh, of interrelations between South and North Korea in schools, uh, young people grow not paying attention to the nature of the conflict and further gradual development of peace process and denuclearization, which is seen only in the frames of uh, prior historical uh, war context and ultimate unification uh, objective. To transform the situation of conflict and neglect and disengagement by younger generation, peace education should be improved by including it in school curriculum and university programs on nuclear disarmament. Um, there is a nuclear non-proliferation education and research center uh, in Seoul, um, which could expand its programs within South Korea in order to attract more young people to join um, and could become a place to host the CTBTO youth group chapter to conduct uh, joint events and collaborate on common projects. KAIST uh, University, uh, I was very pleased to get to know uh, Mr. Um, sorry, Yum. Yum, yeah, from uh, South Korea, from this university, um, uh, is an example of the university where, um, which is teaching nuclear engineering programs and could link uh, the characteristics and advantages elements of CTBTO, such as international monitoring system with its verification technical benefits. This could be implemented by introducing a special course uh, with the focus on CTBT or CTBTO um, and include practical application of the international monitoring system to the case of Korean Peninsula, in particular nuclear tests conducted by North Korea. It could serve also as a basis for cooperation between uh, KAIST and James Center for Non-Proliferation Studies on Monterey in USA if such um, cooperation was not yet established in order to contribute to capacity building in the field of nuclear technologies. Uh, another important aspect in this uh, peace process is of course dialogue and exchange uh, forming which can contribute to the peace building in Korean uh, Peninsula. Small steps such as education tourism a uh, visit to DMZ, demilitarized zone, could stimulate interest amongst public, uh, personal involvement and touch to the history to better understand the divide and learn about current crisis. Some of the recent actions could be continuing to be taken in the area of arts, uh, sports and culture. For example, a uh, unified Korean team um, performance during the Olympics Games in South Korea recently performance of K-pop uh, artists in North Korea last year, um, the joint bid to host Olympic Games in uh, 2032, invitation and participation of North Koreans to participate in the Pyeongchang Peace Forum uh, ne uh, next year in 2020, where the separate session on CTBT could be conducted. Pyeongchang City uh, could become also a member of organization called Mayors for Peace, uh, which is uh, headquartered in Hiroshima in Japan, and the organization is aimed uh, to promote peace uh, and security, given its uh, tragic history of Hiroshima. Um, since I have noticed that the number of South Korean uh, cities who are members of the Mayors for Peace, um, is also low, it's around 18, whereas the general total number of the mayors for peace cities uh, is around 7,000. So you can imagine the difference. Uh, and here I would like to know that uh, Simipolitinsk, uh, the city in Kazakhstan is one of the lead cities of the mayors for peace organization. The experience of Kazakhstan and other countries uh, that have suffered from humanitarian consequences of nuclear tests can be used to encourage North Korea to join the CTB team. The International Day Against Nuclear Test, August 29, is a good opportunity to publicize this. Uh, when it comes to engaging legislators, the young members of parliament uh, in South Korea could organize public hearings, debates, uh, and motions on CTB team so that population, including youth, can follow uh, the agenda and global developments in the field of uh, nuclear disarmament. 
to engage this topic globally uh, in cooperation with the Interparliamentary Union, which includes South and North Korea as its members, the CTBTO uh, and CTBTO Youth Group could have a session on the Forum of Young Parliamentarians uh, and at the Standing Committee on Peace and Security. Uh, in these lines, I also would like to mention about uh, peace journalism uh, and its um, vital role uh, in helping and contributing to the development of dialogue in Korean Peninsula. Uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, peace journalism is something that goes beyond of ordinary journalism uh, and is focusing more on positive uh, and impactful narratives uh, of transformation by avoiding language of conflicts, uh, blaming um, and providing simple facts and information. Of course, we do understand that it's challenging to engage youth in North Korea. However, CTBTO Youth Group, uh, with the help of CTBTO and uh, mentioning the United Nations disarmament agenda uh, on future generations um, and sustainable development goals, could help to send the letter to the Youth League of North Korea, informing them about the CTBTO Youth Group and inviting them to join. Regardless of any reaction, either positive or negative, or even uh, receiving non-response, this could be a start of youth-led talks. Thank you. Any, any questions from the audience? Yes. Just Could you speak up? Uh, uh, microphone. The microphone is there. Uh, I'm very much touched how you are uh, considering the future for the young generation and you are very much willing to con introduce all possibility to maintain peace all over the world. Of course, and the very first is to eliminate atomic bomb and nuclear weapon. But the, all the problems, North Korea and South Korea, is rather psychological problems because my as a scientist, I'm saying always, if a capitalism would be perfect, communism would be never born. No one, no other is perfect. From both, we should take the best and go forward. And for example, money sickness of rich people are terrible. They have billions and they want to have more billions. They never stop. And uh, uh, if they would give this money for the poor in the right time, we could avoid revolution in Russia, Revolution in France, Vietnam War, and Korea War. But afterwards, they have the money to kill them. So what we need, raise a little bit standard of life of these poor people. And that's it. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Yes. Thank you. I'm Ilya Korsenko from the CTBTO Youth Group. Uh, Marjan, I, um, it's been mentioned that you work in Europe, though um, your presentation tells us that you're still very involved with what's going on in your home country and you're studying uh, the progress towards the you know, the non-nuclear um, development of Kazakhstan. And how, how, does, uh, how do you manage to combine these two uh, directions? working um, in Europe, but still being very, um, you know, involved into what's happening in Kazakhstan. Good, thank you. Uh, so I consider myself as a global citizen, and I think that uh, the issue of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation uh, is a matter of uh, global peace and security. Uh, and therefore, uh, my activities are linked, of course, uh, to my home country, which inspired me, the Kazakhstan's nuclear legacy. Uh, and uh, since at the moment I'm currently and temporarily based in Europe, uh, I use the opportunities to, um, to be active where I am. So I also have um, many events happening as well in America. So I think it's, um, it depends on the way how you cooperate and collaborate with others. And for me, uh, the issue of nuclear disarmament cannot be um, approached only from one side, and it needs to be in collaboration. So in, in my case, uh, I have exemplified in the speech that uh, there are many different ways of how to engage uh, everyone in the society, uh, especially where young people can take lead. Uh, and 
wherever I am and whenever there is a chance, uh, I try to advocate uh, for nuclear disarmament. I try to raise awareness and I think this is uh, what we should all do as an agents of change. Okay, thank you. I think there is one more question, if you can make it quick, because our time's up. Just make it very quick. Okay, so first, thank you very much for that very thorough and enlightened and very practical um, um, presentation. It was fantastic. Very quick question is, what can my generation provide to amazing people like you in order to best support your work? Thank you. Um, just yesterday we were having a, a networking event uh, with the groups of eminent persons and CTBTO youth group members. And the topic that we were discussing in our group was on intergenerational um, cooperation. So I think that um, the seniors, uh, the elders, uh, can share with us their own experiences, their skills and expertise in what they are good at and where they can provide mentorship for us to take um, more leadership, to feel empowered and confident as well, uh, to bring um, changes as well as transformation. Okay. Thank you very much. We have to move yeah. on to the next, because we yes. have two minutes. Sure, very short question. Thank you, I'm uh, Olaf Andrieu from United Nations. Uh, you, you told us that there were uh, 10 uh, students from Peninsula in the uh, CTB uh, UG. Uh, are there uh, North Korean students in this uh, term? How yeah. many? Thank you. So the CTBTO youth group uh, members from South Korea are about uh, nine or ten, and unfortunately at the moment we don't have uh, any young people from North Korea. But we are working on uh, engaging uh, youth from North Korea. So I think this session is providing us with the food for thought how to do that. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> our next speaker comes from uh, Observer Research Foundation in India. Uh, Is there this person? Mr. India. Mm -hmm. uh, this account is not there. Oh, well, sorry. Ms. Nurjan, then you have a more chance time to answer questions. Sorry, I cut you off. But I may follow up with some of the points raised here. So you said there are about nine or 10 students members as part of CTBTO youth in South Korea. Uh, in fact, the interest or awareness of CTBTO in South Korea is very low. Uh, and you mentioned something about CTBTO awareness a conference, but the bigger question in South Korea right now is, well, since North Korea has nuclear weapons, why not us? So about 60% of South Korean public, including young people, think South Korea has to develop nuclear weapons. So bringing the di dialogue on CTBTO is sort of a, having a delicate relationship with that kind of a, a public sentiment. So for example, our organization, my organization, KAIST or NERAC, we have a nuclear non education education research center. We've been doing public outreach uh, dialogues. S does country South Korea need nuclear weapons? We bring in people from different perspective and then have uh, an opportunity to students engage. What are the pros and cons? What are the realities? What are the real needs? After the, this dialogue, we give them a survey before and after. And we found that, that the students' ad attitude and perception of nuclear weapons can change. So I think the effort we talk about CTBTO has to be preceded by some dialogue on is nuclear weapons necessary or is, is it something that we should think about? I think after people have better informed uh, ideas on the presence of nuclear weapons, they now have a better idea, maybe toward better acceptance of CTBTO in South Korea. I think that's something we need to work on before we start talk, talking about CTBTO. But definitely some of the members of CTBTO youth group in South Korea are actually products of our programs, research fellows and summer fellows who will be working with you closely to, to help the cause of what you are doing. This is also that I would like to tell you because take the, the knowledge transfer from the others and that they know what to do for that and they know what, what it is and then it can help you to deal with it what you want to do. Because so far I think that, uh, okay, this is something that it is a kind of dream, we are dreaming, and me too, I like to dream. But 
we have to go down to the real tea, and the real tea in the on the land is uh, completely different. They ask for 60% of people because they have nuclear weapons. But this, you see, there's a kind of uh, contradiction on that. You see, this is some kind of yeah. thing. And the, my, my, my question also is, did you start to, to have a discussion with people there in North Korea to have a contact? And did you start to do something? Or just you are thinking about that you are going to do this? This is my question. Something needs to be very carefully arranged. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know what so happened to one beer? <laughs> you don't remember? Yeah. One time I met one person who is the, one of the Nobel Prize. His name is Abdul Salam. What he told me, when I was very young at that time. He, he told me, Gerald, don't forget that. There's very big luck between ideal and reality. And that's, you see, this, this uh, I, I I'd like to bring it to the reality that uh, on field there's something very different. So think about that and have an exchange with the, <laughs> I call that the mentors. There was uh, a special CTBTO outreach in South Korea, May 31st in, in, in Seoul. There were about 150 students attending that event. So uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, Dr. Larson Ajobo, they all came and actually gave a special talk on the, on the importance of nuclear non-proliferation and there are a lot of children interested in so I think it sounds like you were not aware of those events. If you, these things can be better coordinated with the CTBTO and uh, your network and maybe students who are present, it will help, definitely help what you are trying to achieve. So I can give you some context. Okay, thank you. Can I respond? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, on being down to earth and um, looking at this uh, from the realism perspective, I think that we as a young people, we do have dreams and we do have ambitions. Exactly. And if we see only in the conditions of reality, uh, I don't think there will be any progress. We have been already seeing that disarmament and nuclear weapons, uh, these are the things that are existing for a long time. Uh, and just take an example of non-proliferation treaty. It's been 50, 50 years. So how long should we wait? Like, should we still uh, be stuck to the reality? Um, yeah, this is one of the questions. Um, another thing about the, the events in South Korea, um, there are activities uh, and events that uh, probably to have taken place, as you have informed me recently. But as I have said uh, from the very beginning of my presentation, uh, I do not uh, claim to be an expert in this issue. I just have started. So it's just some initial thoughts from the pragmatic point of view um, and not from the very scientific, I would say, because it's about capacity building. Um, and according to the statistics, uh, I have checked the um, information before presenting it. So I can also provide you with the data which states that um, there are only nine or 10 um, students from Korea and Peninsula, like from, so from South Korea. Uh, probably some of the students have applied, but it takes time for their applications to be approved. So it also depends. But I was dealing with the fact that I was receiving before coming to the conference. Okay. Um, Good point. Yeah. So what else was there? Uh, and about NEREC, I'm very much interested in this program because I know that you have um, so-called graduate um, fellowships, which would be of interest to many young people here to get to know about this program and get much more involved. Um, yeah, I think this was it, yeah. But thank you for the comments. I will definitely take them into consideration uh, and work with you more. Um, and yeah, that's it. Okay. I think we're not supposed to start until the time uh, is, is up. So if anybody have any other questions or comments, I'll be happy to take them. Yes. Uh, Ilya Korsenka, CTBO Youth Group. I had a question about, I remember this um, youth 
uh, actions uh, that were taken in the 60s, particularly in 1968, you know, the um, age when uh, serious uh, achievements were made uh, in terms of um, just the actions for global peace and disarmament. Um, nowadays, the world has changed a little, and um, if such an action took uh, place, how would you imagine it to look like uh, from the perspective of the digital technologies and taking into account how connected the world is? How would you imagine such an uh, action? The question is posed to the panel or our speaker, maybe even anyone in the audience, anybody who feels compelled to answer that question, or to make any comments on the question that Ilya pointed out. So your question is, how do we make that kind of connection in today's world with digital evolution and uh, SNS in this age of SNS? As does anybody want to offer any? Advice, yes. Could you hand down the microphone? Yeah, um, my Could you introduce yourself? Yeah. Please? Yeah, I'm Jean-Maurice Crete. Uh, before that, I was working at the AEA, and now I'm retired, and I enjoy life, so. <laughs> um, <coughs> coming back to, to your question, I think that the problem today, I was recently reading a book which is called The Death of Expertise. And I think this is a book to read because it clearly explained that today there is way too much information and information which is not reviewed by peer as it was the case in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or even 90s. With internet, most of the information is put forward without any control. So first we need to be extremely careful with this source of knowledge coming from a digital uh, world. Second, they, in this book he explained that we tend to put scientists on the front line and we forget ethics and we forget philosophy. That means that gives a perspective to how we can use the knowledge to better communicate and to better achieve our goal. And that step today is missing when, to me, in my generation, we spend a lot of time on studying philosophy and what the world should look like, not only through the eyes of a scientist or calculation or software or model, but from the reality. Because reality, you cannot escape from reality. Hmm. And so I think that, and, and the last point that he mentioned in his book is that there is a kind of degradation of the education at, uh, in the universities because education today tends to become more and more a business instead of staying in education. So that many university open programs just to make money, to make it short. And therefore, again, it's forgetting what education should be, what ethics should be, and how people should be educated, not only to get a diploma in order to make money, but to really be a global citizen. Uh, to me, that this is how I see the things. And if we do not change this important trend, which is brought a lot by the digital uh, 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 age, because we don't know how to master that g digital age and we do not educate people on how to master and to get to critical thinking, I think we will have a big problem. So my answer was, please return to what, re what was written in the 60s or 70s because it's really good. And work by yourself, not only through network or through Twitter or tweet and so on because the thought behind those tweets is almost zero. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go back to the fundamentals. <laughs> well, our time is up. Just Unfortunately, I think mm, uh, three, three o'clock. Three o'clock. Maybe after the... Just very short. A short comment, yes. Uh, thank you. I'm Pierce Corden uh, from the United States. Uh, I was very interested in the speaker's observation about whether the DPRK might join the... Uh, 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 
North, South, Southeast Asia nuclear weapon, uh, sorry, the Central Asia nuclear weapon free zone. You also have Mongolia, which is linked to it by, by a, a line uh, across the border. Uh, has there been any consideration that it might then be broadened uh, it, to include, uh, and this is a rather uh, radical thought, uh, the ROK as well? Is this a question to our speaker? Ms. Nurjan. Um, if I understood you correctly, um, so Kazakhstan is a part of Central Asian nuclear weapon free zone and there is a proposal made uh, for the Korean Peninsula to have, uh, to establish North East Asian nuclear weapon free zone, which will have um, a system of uh, three plus three, uh, meaning that um, South Korea, uh, and North Korea uh, and Japan will be free of nuclear weapons. Uh, as well as um, Japan would be freed from nuclear umbrella. Whereas uh, China, Russia, and US um, would provide negative security assurances. So therefore this model is for three plus three. Yeah. There are still discussions being on on this. Um, and however, so far there wasn't much of the progress, but this topic is being discussed. I think with that, we'll have to move on at this point. So our next speaker comes from Moscow, uh, Russia. Mafi, Moscow Engineering and Physics Institute. Uh, the title of our talk is Integrating Women Technicians in CTVTO. Okay, uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's presentation on gender equality. Uh, first of all, may we introduce ourselves. My name is Sophie. I'm a third year student of, student of National Research Nuclear University, MIFI. My major is automatic technology and I am a CYG member. And my name is Maria. I'm also a MIFI third year student and a member of the CTBTO youth group. My major is economic cybersecurity. It's important to say that even though in the CTBTO a considerable improvement has been done in gender parity, there is still a lot to do. That's why we decided to, con to uh, link the CTBTO training and outreach activities with two sustainable development goals, quality education and gender equality, as well as to explore why the technical and scientific fields of this organization are less frequented by women. So, the aim of today's talk is to present the results of our research and suggest strategies and ways to promote lifelong learning and the empowerment of women. Let us start by outlining the points we'd like to discuss with you today. First of all, we will speak about the project, project objectives, then we will analyze the CTBTO achievements, and next we will present the result of the questionnaire which was conducted to identify career preferences among the CIG member at the CTBTO related activities. At the end of our presentation, we'll provide MIFI's examples of gender parity. And last but not least, we'll attempt to suggest some strategies and ways to promote the empowerment of women and lifelong learning. Do you wonder if we could imagine a world without women, without female scientists, politicians, artists, and etc.? What if Maria Skladovska Curie or Sofia Kavalevska had decided that there was no place for them in science? Yes, the development of mankind would not stop, but it would definitely slow down significantly. That is why we have to work to minimize obstacles that are faced by women and enable them to realize their potential. In the course of our research, we pursued three main objectives. The first ob objective was to identify areas where the CTBT and SDGs overlap. The second objective was aimed at suggesting strategies considered to be instrumental to increasing participation of women in science at the CTBTO-related activities. And at the furtherance of the third obje objective, we uh, attempt to identify ways which can contribute to promote the empowerment of women in science. In the pursuit of the first objective, we single out two SDGs, namely SDG 4 and SDG 5. In the pursuit of the second and third objectives, 
we analyze the CTBTO achievements related to gender equality advancement, then looked at the dynamic, dynamic of per gender percentage ratio, and then proposed some methods to gain gender parity. So let's move to the CTBTO achievements. In 2017, Dr. Lassina Zerbo joined the International Gender Champion Initiative. He is personally committed to create the policies and procedures for more flexibility and working hours for the first year of maternity opportunity. He also undertook to create a shadow for a program for up for to 10 students from the high school. The CTBTO helps women in some areas to overcome the hurdles. The PTS is striving for equal participation of both men and women in the organization, especially at the professional and managerial levels. Speaking more about the CTBTO activities that uh, held to support gender parity, we can mention two other events, the National Women's Day and Daughters' Day. These events are held to remind people and society about the necessity of gender equality. CTBTO Executive Secretary Lassine Zerbo also stressed the importance of this topic when he took the floor on the eve of the International Women's Day this year. His quote is, At the CTBTO, we are proud to have reached gender parity at the director level, but our efforts must not stop here. So now we move to our research. A very important part of our project was to develop and conduct a questionnaire, which was targeted at the CTBTO youth group members. It was deemed to be a tool to collect potential linkages between the CTBT and the SDGs. The analysis of the responses made it possible to come up with strategies and ways to promote lifelong learning in the empowerment of women. Now to the statistics. This pie chart shows us the percentage ratio, gender percentage ratio. We could notice that there are more than half of the CRG members are women. It can be concluded that the CTBTO had made, uh, has made a tremendous effort in achieving gender parity. The next graph shows major of the CIG, CYG members. We can see that majority of both men and women have educated in social or humanitarian field. Uh, that indicates that those fields don't face any obstacles in choosing them, both for men and women. Next, uh, for better understanding, uh, Sorry. Right. Oh, some technical problems, but yeah, there should be a graph. That no, there was a graph. <laughs> that, that should be. Yeah, uh, that should be a graph that uh, depicts some uh, statistic that are from that we should be. <laughs> uh, Could you move to the next slide? The next one? Yeah, please. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Oh, <laughs> stop. No problem. No problem there. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> to speak more about preferences in science, uh, let's have a look at the next uh, bar chart. Uh, we could clear it up that we, uh, men are keen on science connected with computer and statistics more than women, while women uh, prefer some humanitarian studies like uh, sociology, psychology, and etc. Maybe there are some reasons for that. And let's move to those reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, the majority of the respondents said that the main reason are stereotypes. Also, people think that there are no reasons. Uh, some people said that it's hard and that the main problem is that family and household take too much time to build career in science. Other answers were not really popular at all. Okay. For better understanding, uh, we try to analyze another, another data. And in all respondents who can't find any reasons, we could up that uh, women, are, women less often believe that there are something that can prevent them from building a career in scientific field. But both gender ask that way, uh, answer that way. And uh, we uh, think that we have to concentrate on uh, people's thinking about this issue. And in this slide, you can see that there are no really considerable differences in career preferences among the CYG members. 
That means that this organization is close to finally achieving gender balance. And our university also tried to achieve gender parity. Um, MIFI holds some activities connected with gender equality and uh, uh, try to make engineering and scientific specialization more popular among their females, female students. MIFI's strategy focuses on the idea that it is important to work with young generation. All activities are aimed to show high school children that nuclear science is very important nowadays, that we have to explore it carefully and not to be afraid of it. The results of those activities is shown in this slide. Uh, these bar charts uh, depict the percentage ratio of the girls that entered MIFI for three years. You can see great progress. Yes, as for me, I know a lot of people from my specialization, and I can say that three years ago there was majority of male students studying economic cybersecurity. Now it's vice versa. So let's move to the results of our uh, research work and the future plans. First of all, we tried to reveal correlation between the field of studies and gender, and we cleared it up that gender doesn't matter uh, when we speak about the choosing the career field. And second, we try to identify exact and effective strategies for women's involvement in science. And speaking about our future plans, we can say that we are going to hold more excursions, on-site visits, poster and presentation contests, and other even events to make engineering and technical specializations more popular and attractive. Uh, the other thing we want to mention that we will continue to conduct other questionnaires to collect more data that will help us to continue our research. So let us conclude our presentation. First of all, uh, the questionnaire showed how much the CTBTO has reached in gender parity. Secondly, it was an example of evidence that stereotypes are something that our society inherited. We just have to work on this problem. Uh, next, the biggest role uh, is played by the stereotypes. It can be a serious problem in the condition of international cooperation. That's why we uh, need to focus on uh, changing people's thinking about this issue. Women need to be shown that they have nothing to fear in their aspirations for science. If they want to be scientists, there are no obstacles for them. If they want it and feel that they have some special ideas to change the world. So let them do this. It's only a start and we will continue our research. Mm -hmm. So if you want more information uh, or want to follow up our research, please feel free to email us. Thank you for your attention. And with that, not only any emails, but any questions or suggestions from the floor. Yes. Ilya Kursenko, CTB Youth Group. I worked uh, with the Russian Commissioner on Human Rights, Tatiana Moskalkova, uh, in f uh, winter on gender equality in Russia. And I still remember the data uh, that she mentioned in one of her uh, speeches that uh, Russia has uh, more women in um, science uh, than men among the ranking of uh, countries um, worldwide. Uh, Russian uh, percentage of women involved into science is, is very high. Though as we go higher in the positions that these women take, uh, male domination increases. How could your project, um, I mean research, address this issue as well? Uh, like why women just, you know, don't proceed as much as they do on the early scale? Thank you for your question. Um, as we realized from the questionnaire and for the statistic, that a uh, very uh, important role also played by uh, the family and household. So we think that that's, that is the reason why, uh, why women don't try to get higher position. Am I answering? Yes. Microphone. Abdel Wahab from the CTBTU. Here you are talking about the equality, gender equality. You are talking about the number of the opportunities because it's different. If you are talk, talking about number 50 50, this is easy to do so they can get 50%, 50%. But if you are talking about opportunities, what I know that uh, if men or women apply for a position, for example, so, and he's qualified, he will get it, women or men. 
there is no discrepancy, uh, discrimination. discrimination here in the gender. So how to help women to get more opportun opportunities, I think it's another subject. So we need to focus on the women, how to get more opportunities to be able to be qualified for some position, for example. Adding to that, I think that uh, we can consider also th this point that, uh, for example, we had uh, several trainings within the CTBTO and for the application from the state signatories, less participants as women. It's not up to the CTBTO, that fact. It's up to the state signatory because there are no more women involved in two from the country, from your countries. But not, it's not from the CTB2 point of view. From our point of view, just we have to consider all of that in a global picture. And then I can ensure that, the for example, for following training here, we put more weight for women, not that for men. Men, the, the, the don't look over me like that. But this is the fact. We put more weight for the women. And that's. You, you from a country's guide. I think that this is one of the points that you have to improve and to, to help people there, to, to women to, to, to get more into that, to be involved. Yeah. Um, my name is Alona Yakule. I want to add your comments. Thank you very much because for support of women. Um, I'm president of Women in Nuclear Russia, you know, international organization. And we're trying to do a lot to that women scientists be more recognizable, more interesting mm -hmm. and attractive to public. And this is not an easy question. And I completely agree, agree with, completely agree with you that it's a big efforts to um, promote for women, for, uh, for women uh, from from the uh, from the side of from from men support women uh, support women because I think it's one of the possible way, of course, to create uh, um, professional communities, pro professional, strong professional communities of, of women nuclear scientists, first of all, and encourage open public dialogue uh, on the relevant of the uh, uh, variety of relevant issues. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's also international cooperation, okay, of course, it's very important where uh, women uh, uh, scientists ca come, exchange some best practice ideas, opinion about uh, issues, and, and of course from supporting men, of course. <laughs> and I think is and it's very important, I think, uh, for developing uh, nuclear, uh, so to support uh, an increase in uh, women in science, uh, developing um, mass media channel where women can educate, can discuss, can, um, can learn more about how they be more, uh, to be more recognizable, interesting, and be more experienced in nuclear. This is, of course, I think it's one of the things very important. And thank you for support of women. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And our next speaker, thank you very much. Thank you. But um, just I'd like to note that it, it was a very nice presentation <laughs> with this uh, ping pong. <laughs> very, very nice, creative way of presenting information. Thank you. Our next speaker also comes from Moscow, uh, Russia, uh, from MEFI, National Research Univers Nuclear University. So th this is the name of the, the person who presented. Ah, uh, okay. One. So Mr. Ivan Drozov. Both. Through the both. Through the both. Title of his talk is NRLA New MEFI as an educational site for relevant CTBTO problem solving. Mr. <coughs> Rojo. Can I start? Yes. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Ivan Drozdov, and uh, I uh, will speak on topic NRLA New MEFI as an educational platform for relevant CTBTO solving. Okay, uh, so I will start with what is, what is MEFI? 
The institute was founded in 1942. It was the hardest year for the Eastern Front during the Second World War. And uh, already in 1953, uh, it became university with three departments, high energy physics, nuclear physics and technology, and the cybersecurity department, which in fact started the development of informational technologies in my country. The founders of MIFI are world-known Nobel laureates in physics, Tom, Frank, Semenov, Basov, Sakharov, Cherenkov. So nowadays, MIFI is a wide branch, multi-directional university with a reputation of international expert with a worldwide partnership links. MIFI consists of several so-called strategic uh, academic units which collaborate with various industrial and academic partners including Rosatom, CERN, Rostec, Kurchatov Institute and International Atomic Energy Agency. Many of the strategic academic units also energize mega projects of our time including the ITER fusion reactor currently under cons construction in France as well as ALICE and and ATLAS high energy physics experiments in CERN in Switzerland. MIFI is proud to be a symbol of ingenuity and innovation in civilian nuclear science and technology. Having said that, MIFI is working hard on expanding into new and exciting fields. The main goal is to provide the tools and skills professionals need to succeed in an interconnected and interdisciplinary global scene. So here are some, some of the university focus areas are nuclear physics and technology, nuclear power engineering and thermophysics, physics, mathematics applied to physics, to informational uh, material study and material technologies, uh, cybersecurity, uh, international relations, um, foreign languages, economics, business, management and law. So here you can see some statistics on these uh, five strategic academic units and the uh, four institutes we have. So uh, let's make a quick rundown on the list. Uh, the Institute of Nuclear Physics and Engineering. Uh, the aim of uh, this institute is the creation and development of the world level scientific and educational center in the field of nuclear physics and technology radiation material science, elementary particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmophysics. This institute includes more than 20 departments in Moscow and more than uh, 300 affiliated scientists in faculties all over the world. Uh, the next institute is the uh, Institute of Engineering Physics uh, for Biomedicine. This strategic, the strategic goal of this institute is the development of technologies of engineering physics for biomedicine and their active employment in the educational process in order to bridge the gap between scientific research, education, device manufacturing and practical medicine. The structure of this institute includes 17 departments and more than 200 affiliated scientists all over the world. Uh, the Institute of Laser and Plasma Technologies uh, the main objectives of the Laplace Institute in the, in the sector of scientific research are laser, plasma, radiation and beam technologies and their applications to the energy production industry, medicine and the life sciences. Environment friendly energy production based on controlled nuclear fusion. And uh, need to be said, uh, compact tabletop laser plasma particle accelerators for proton therapy. The Institute, um, the Institute of Nano en Engineering in Electronics, Spintronics and Photonics fo f and Photonics is focused on research electronics based on new principles and materials, functional system engineering, terahertz nano nanophotronics. And the last one, the Institute uh, uh, of cyber intelligence systems. The main research directions is cybersecurity, uh, platform technologies, financial security, artificial intelligence, neurotechnology, modeling, processing of physical data, 
cryptographic methods of information protection. I need to be said that uh, in the last year, uh, this inst institute showed the highest passing rate according to the results of admission campaign. So, uh, a few words uh, about MEFI as an international education platform. Nowadays, more than 20% of students in MIFI accounts for foreign students, more than 10% uh, for foreign faculties, and more than 25% for foreign educational programs. MIFI cooperates with uh, many international organizations. And in uh, 2017, uh, MIFI hosted the first uh, CYG conference in Moscow, Russia. GEMS and youth group members from more than 10 countries participated in the event. In three days, uh, participants and members uh, of CYG, uh, of um, CTBTU youth group, uh, discussed, uh, were representing global regions and were debating uh, for and against the, uh, the rule that nuclear technology holders must ratify the treaty. And there were a tour to the uh, Russian Federation Natural, uh, National Data Center. The first time foreign students have visited the center at, at Dubna, uh, which is uh, situated in the north of Moscow region. And uh, uh, the conference was very instrumental in expanding CYG membership. So, uh, in the, uh, excuse me, yes, and uh, uh, on the opening uh, ceremony, uh, there were uh, CTBTO execu executive secretary, uh, Lassine Zerbo, uh, Deputy Foreign Mi Mi Minister Sergei Rybkov and the Rector of the MIFI, uh, Mikhail Strikhanov. So, uh, the next year, the next year, uh, MIFI uh, took part in a uh, CTBTO Science and Diplomacy Symposium uh, in Vienna, Austria. Uh, the MIFI uh, CYG group actively participated in all the events during the symposium and uh, uh, MIFI was responsible for, organi for organizing uh, the presentation contest on the margins of symposium. And uh, I would like to finish my presentation with uh, that MIFI is planning to strengthen cooperation with CTBTO, and I hope in future MIFI will host more CTBT-related events. Looking for this. So, thank you for possibility to speak, to speak up, and uh, for your attention, I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you. So, before we move on with the questions, I have one quick announcement. You had just three speakers in this session, and you have an opportunity to vote for the best pr presentation today. So go to the conference website or the mobile Not app, problem. and then vote for the best presentation for the day. So yes, it's relatively easy. You have only three choice. And then also there is a parallel poster presentation going on to, for the day. So poster session 5.3, uh, today and yesterday, you pick one best paid poster you think is, uh, and that voting will end Tuesday evening, and then tomorrow we'll have another set of posters putting up. So please vote for the best presentation as well as best poster. Now we open up the floor for the question and answer. Yes. Hello, my name is Remy. Um, I wanted to find out uh, when you organized the 2017 meeting, what were the uh, problems, especially logistic, logistic problems that you found in inviting people from uh, youths from developing countries? Okay, thank you for your question. 
Um, actually, uh, I need to say that um, I starting in MIFI from the uh, 2018, and as I know, there was no problem in logistics. Um, maybe, maybe I should to check up this information, but as for me, there was no problems. Any other questions? Well, if not, we have just reached our time limit for the session. So thank you all for coming to this session, and I hope you can continue to participate in our uh, session on the uh, mm, capacity building and education and public awareness tomorrow morning starting at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. I will take care of this highlight report. Okay. We cannot add in the post session. It will be replaced. Uh, no, no. We need to replace the file. We need to put it back in. The no, entire set. For example, for example. Good afternoon. So we will start the, we'll continue the session uh, T1.1 atmospheric dynamics that we uh, stopped this morning and we will continue with uh, a few more talks. We have two talks before the coffee break and then uh, a few more afterward. So um, we will have the first speaker of the afternoon session will be, uh, is it Dr. Golikova? Yes, Dr. Golikova that will be talking about recording of internal gravity waves and infrasound waves from the warm and cold front in Moscow region. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, let me introduce my presentation, which name is recording of internal gravity waves and infrasound waves from the warm and cold fronts in Moscow region. The main objective is as follows. Registration of internal gravity waves from atmospheric fronts and their classifications according to the probability of occurrence of dangerous phenomena such as thunderstorms, squalls, tornadoes based on the characteristics of the received signal. It's important to make the detection of internal gravity waves and their classification in advance a few hours before the occurrence of dangerous phenomena associated with the meteorological front. An important problem is the organization of a system for continuous monitoring of internal gravity waves in the atmosphere. A unique complex has been developed in Moscow and its region in order to continuously record internal and infrasound waves. This complex makes it possible to record uh, wave disturbances of different scales in the field of atmospheric pressure using a network uh, of microbarographs and infrasonic receivers. The measuring complex includes a network of four microbarographs to measure wave atmospheric pressure disturbances within a frequency range and Infrasound, uh, infrasound and internal gravity waves. Uh, these microbiographs are located in the city of Moscow, its Institute of Atmospheric Physics and uh, Moscow State University and uh, Moscow region. The distance between the microbiographs is from seven to 
54 kilometers. A correlation analysis of data obtained with this complex was made simultaneously with analysis of data on pressure fluctuations measured at infrasonic station Dubna using six infrasonic receivers. Atmospheric fresh variations recorded from May 23 to May 30, 27 year at the no network of four microbarographs. The fluctuation intensity increased on the night of May 29 and the pressure jumped before the passage of the storm on May 29. The pressure jumps uh, were observed on the previous day, uh, May 24 and uh, 25, which associated with the passage of atmospheric fronts on these days. These fronts were preceded by long wave precursors and uh, it seen that the larger the amplitude of the pressure jump associated with the given front is, the larger the amplitude of its wave precursors is uh, approximately three, uh, four hours before the pressure jump. In this slide show the dependence of the amplitude of pressure jumps before the atmospheric fronts on the amplitude of pressure variations in the wave precursors of the front arrival. This dependence is uh, um, plotted according to 12 fronts. Uh, the tendency for an increase in the amplitudes of pressure jump with increasing the amplitudes of pressure is clearly seen. The next slide gives the results of the correlation analysis of atmospheric pressure fluctuations measured by three microbarographs from May 23 to May 30. With the passage of atmospheric fronts through receivers, as a result, the horizontal speed and signal intensity increase. The clear pronounced time intervals uh, within which the sum of time uh, legs is close to zero when the correlation function tends to unity. Within these intervals, one can see the stable azimuths of arrivals of waves and the horizontal phase velocities. An, analy an analysis of meteorological maps uh, showed that on the night of May 29, the warm front approached Moscow and the cold front arrived in Moscow uh, 1530 in Moscow. The long train of waves left rectangles recorded at the five stations was associated with the arrival of the warm front. The main internal gravity wave arrival with a rapid change in the signal intensity was recorded approximately at uh, 15.30, right rectangles. During the passage of the cold front in the afternoon um, of May 29, squalls of destructive winds whose velocity reached 30 meters per second were observed in Moscow and Moscow region. The next slide gives the results of the correlation analysis of atmospheric pressure fluctuations measured by the three microbarographs from the atmospheric storm. The mean direction of the signal arrival during the passage of the cold front was about 307 degrees. The signal arrived from the northwestern direction. The horizontal phase velocities of propagation of these waves exceeded wind velocities and reached 50 meters per second. This provided the possibility of using internal gravity wave precursors in forecasting the passage of atmospheric fronts in advance, in real time. The correlation analysis of pressure variations for receivers in Dubna within different frequency ranges made it possible to separate out both internal gravity and infrasound waves. 
And this slide shows in top panel the signal recorded by one for the receivers in Dubna and the horizontal phase velocities of internal gravity and ultrasound waves within different frequency ranges during the passage of warm and cold fronts throughout the town of Dubna. Within low frequency ranges, corresponding periods are five minutes, the phase velocities of wave, dis of wave disturbances don't exceed 50 meters per second. They are characteristic of internal gravity waves. Note that internal gravity waves were observed a few hours before and after the passage of the storm through the receiving network. When passing to high frequency ranges, corresponding periods are shorter than 100 seconds. Phase velocity dis disturbances rapidly increase and reach 1,000 meters per second, panel four and eight. The next slide show top left infrasound level for one of the receivers. Uh, below the cross correlation function for the pair of receivers and horizontal phase velocity corresponding to correlation maxima. On the right, diagram of warm and cold fronts inclined arrows denote infrasound radiations by the fronts. During the passage of the warm front, the horizontal phase velocity tends to decrease with time approximately from 1,000 to 330 meters per second. This may be caused by the fact that as the warm front approaches, infrasounds at first arrive at large grazing angles to the land surface from highly located form sectors. And as the warm front continues to approach, infrasound arrive from low front sectors and at low grazing angles. During the passage of the cold front with another geometry and slope to the land surface, the phase velocity tends to increase with time after the passage of the front. The next slide, uh, Processing the records of atmospheric pressure fluctuations during the passage of a warm front. And the next slide, um, during the passage of a cold front uh, using PMCC. And uh, my conclusion, data on internal gravity and infrasound waves recorded during the passage of warm and cold fronts throughout Moscow uh, which are associated with the atmospheric storm. The structure and sizes of the measuring complex have made it possible to reliably determine the characteristics such as coherence, azimuth, and propagation velocities of the basic intervals of internal gravity waves from the atmospheric fronts within a wavelength range of a few to hundreds of kilometers. There are prospects for creating a system of warning about atmospheric fronts approaching Moscow region and estimating the power on the basis of data obtained with the four microbarographs located in Moscow and Moscow region. The analysis of uh, data obtained with this measuring complex and uh, from infrasonic measurements in the town of Dubna has made it possible to observe the transition from internal gravity waves to the acoustic gravity waves generated by the front. It was revealed a rapid change in the phase velocity of waves with increasing frequency. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any question? question so thank you very much so we'll move on to the next presenter uh, which will be uh, Thibaut Arnal we'll be talking about remote monitoring volcanic eruptions using IMS infrasound data
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Thibaut Arnal, and I will present you a system we developed under the ARAISE project uh, about monitoring volcanic eruption using IMS infrasound uh, system network. So it's uh, developed under the ARISE project in close cooperation with the University of Firenze, the Meteo France uh, Volcanic Ash Advisory Center of Toulouse, and the CTBTO. So uh, we, we will first have a quick look about uh, how infrasound can uh, detect volcanic eruption and how it may supplement other monitoring techniques like uh, satellite observation. Then we will have a closer look at how the, the system is working, how we evolve from proof of concept to a more robust and global prototypes, prototype. <clears throat> and then we will see the results of the testing we performed, mainly focused about the Etna, uh, Volca Etna volcano in Italy and other volcano we tested. Then finally, as it's still a prototype, we will discuss, at, at least from my point of view, what is still left to do for making it a near real time operating system. So a bit of context for this project. The, um, Volcanic eruptions might uh, emit gases and ashes into the atmosphere, and we counted about around 1,500 active volcanoes worldwide, active over the past 10,000 years. And these volcanoes, they can do several damage to the aircraft with the ash plumes. And as you see, we cannot have dedicated instrumentation for each volcano on the on the image over there, the, you have superimposed the active volcanoes in the dif different region and the flight paths. And we need re remote observa observation techniques to be able to evaluate eruptions for all these volcanoes. So um, there's been 94 and ash encounters uh, of commercial flight between 1953 and 2009. And above these uh, ash encounters, there's been nine encounters which caused damage engine shut down dur during flight, which nobody wants to happen. So on average, the, these uh, damaging encounters, they happen uh, within the 24 hours and close to the volcano less than 1,000 kilometers. So to better handle the, this risk, the International Civil Aviation, ICAO, uh, mandated uh, volcanic ash advisory centers to coordinate and disseminate the information about uh, volcanic ash clouds. In this context, um, the infrasound provide a global and continuous measurement and it might supplement other techniques. Uh, ICAO expressed the need to CTBTO since 2005 and since 2007, IDC is, discussion, is discussing with uh, VAC Toulouse to, let's say, promote and develop a system able to uh, monitor volcanic eruptions. So there's been a lot of research for demonstrating the feasibility of detecting a volcanic eruption with infrasound. And just for an example, the, the explosion of uh, the eruption of Sarichev Peak, Coral Island, in June 2009, it has been detected by six IMS infrasound, uh, infrasound station up to 6,000 kilometers. And if we have a look at the data at uh, E44, 40, which is uh, 600 kilometers from the, from the volcano, we have the eruption the sequence quite well detailed by the infrasound measurements. And infrasound then can very much complement the, the, the satellite observation. If on the, under the second graph, you have the, when the satellite observed the ash plumes and below the infrasound measurements. And we can see that we can provide more detailed information, especially if there is a dense cloud coverage. So why using the IMS network? We, we both agree that we all agree that it's uh, very good quality data. We have now multi-year quali quality recordings. It has a uh, very good global coverage. Uh, this is um, a map where the, we put all the IMS stations as of December 2016, 
and we color coded the, every active volcano over the last past 10,000 years uh, in relation to the distance to the first, the nearest IMS station. And we get a median distance for any volcano to the nearest uh, station of around 9,980 uh, 9 kilometers, which means, which implies a mean travel time of 55 minutes. And this will be improved uh, with the completion of the IMS ne infrasound network. So why this uh, project happens under the ARISE project? We decided to develop the system, the volcanic information system. We use the synergy between CTBTO, which provides uh, the, the um, operational structure, the, the, um, the good stations the, and the infrastructure. ARISE uh, project brings the level of science with the modeling of just atmosphere and the propagation evaluation. And the final client would be the, the volcanic astro advisory centers. And we closely w worked with the VAC Toulouse, which was mandated by ICAO to demonstrate the usefulness of infrasonic data to monitor volcanic eruptions. And yeah, we developed the prototype system that has been tested and under a RISE 2 project last year. So the objective of the software is to detect a volcanic eruption as soon and as certainly as possible. And for this, we are in long range propagation and we have to account for this propagation effect. Then once we were able to, to confirm that, we, that it looks like a uh, volcanic eruption, we have to disseminate the uh, information to the VAX and to the ARIS data portal. We also try to evaluate the volcanic source term, but at the same time the origin time and the source amplitude of the, of the volcanic eruption, which are critical parameters to model the dispersion of the ash plume. We also try to get the lowest false alarm rate and playing a bit with the parametrization because if we want people to trust our system, we, we have to, to, to have most of the time the real notification. So basically is the, the prototype architecture uh, which has been implemented on VDEC, the virtual data exploitation, uh, the, well, the testing environment for CTBTO. And we use infrasound data, ECMWF models, and we communicate with Vactolus and Arise Data Portal. So how does it work? We, <coughs> we first select the, the data and we were, were looking for infrasound detection which could, which could be matching with uh, volcanic eruptions. So we have filtering on the distance. We don't want very far uh, detection. We want uh, azimuth deviation maximum of 10 degree and we also filter on the frequency. Then we try to group the, the, the detection from different station and try to see if it could match uh, volcanic eruption. What we brought really for us new for in comparison with the, the, the previous proof of concept on this topic was that we were using the, the semi-empirical frequency wind dependent attenuation relation and we were discarding strongly attenu attenuated signals. Then we built a new uh, quality criteria com and not exactly a quality criteria, a parameter called infrasound parameter. I will get later on on what is it. And for the notification system, we discussed with Vactolus and we were sending a uh, notification and consolid consolidated notification every three hours. And once we don't record anything for six hours, we can say that the eruption has ended. So this is from some uh, colleague work that if you want to attend the presentation from MNRA Marketing, uh, it's been on Thursday, it will be on Thursday, 10 a.m. So they, they, they are working on monitoring Etna at a local, uh, local scale. And they developed this uh, infrasound parameter, which is used to characterize the eruption persi persistency and magnitude. 
we have the IP criterion, which is accounting for the number of detections per minute that we multiply by the average RMS pressure at what kilometer of the source. So in the, in the graph below, we, the, this is the Italian uh, early warning system with different level. A W0 means nothing's happening. A W1, the one in a W2, the highest level of warning. For this, they operate a uh, two infrasound network, where you, you can see on, on the map, uh, which are located five and six kilometers from the, from the crater. So we focused our first uh, testing about uh, Etna eruption, and especially those were the active period of May 2016. Why we did this? Because the, it was a well-monitored volcano, and we have data since 2007. It's a good candidate because uh, we also have a good infrastructure uh, network uh, in Europe. And downwind we observe uh, very well the, the, um, the detection at E48, E26, and the experimental arise array in south of France. So, uh, on, the, on this graph, we collocated the, the, the infrasound detection and the volcanic ash advisories emitted by, the, by Meteo France. And we see that we basically detect, well, we have detections when they, were, when they are emitting the, the vac. The orange code co corresponds to a volcanic eruption with no or minor ash emission, and the red is the, the code for emission with significant ash em into the atmosphere. That's the, now the IP calculation. We calculated the infrasound parameter every 15 minutes, and we fixed a trigger for the IP threshold to say, okay, we have an eruption at 10, and we were discarding strongly attenuated uh, signal over 110 dB. So we see that we, we have the, 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 all the sequences well identified com corresponding to the uh, VAC notifications. So the three, yeah, the three major eruptive sequences are well observed and very well matched the emitted VR. The IP uh, ID indicator it is really timely accounting for the dynamic of the eruption. If, uh, if we go back, like we see that within the same, what we consider the same eruption, there are different periods where, where the IP rise quite a lot and when it's calmer. So I think it could be useful information for the, for the VAX. And this is uh, an example of the notification we sent to the, the VAC where we can, you can find the, the location of the volcano, the origin time, the end time if the eruption has ended, and all the detection you get from, the, from every station you consider. Then we, we started to say, okay, monitoring at nice is nice, but if we want to make a robust prototype, we, we have to, to expand to, to have like almost systematic testing. And we've been looking at the, first at the major eruptions and from the global, global volcanism program, and we were looking at these uh, eruptions over there. And this was, a, in fact, uh, able to detect all the major eruptions associated with the VA we, we tested. We, it was even interesting, if we take the case of Meru, uh, the VAC Toulouse emitted uh, an alert well, we didn't have any detection, and in fact, there was no eruption associated with the Meru volcano. Then we also performed systematic comparison with the UNIFI early warning results, and what we could have seen that it's the most significant episode of lava fontaining and ash eruption were very well identified by the software. For smaller events, um, it was, the system was really de highly depending on the propagation condition. That is to say that uh, on, on summer, it was very well much detected than on winter. And 
on the left you have the, the result display into the Arise data portal. So <clears throat> this project brings up several communities from CTBTO, the operational uh, work, the Arise, the level of research and data analysis, and we have a very clear uh, end user for our products. And this, pro this project brings up all the communities and I think everybody can find interest in it. Uh, I'm happy that we managed to develop a prototype that had been tested and that uh, raised interest in the infrasound community. The first results are promising, especially for the large eruption, which can be detected for um, the long distances. But we don't have to stop here. Like, there is still some more work to do to first improve the reliability of the notification results. We still have uh, to reduce the false alarm rate. We still have to do further evaluation for using any volcanic eruption database we have. So the GVP, the LUB for LUB from CTBTO. We <coughs> We still have to improve the source amplitude cal calculation for the, the eruption, which maybe estimate the, the acoustic energy, which is critical for uh, volcanic re vol researchers to uh, estimate the, the flux uh, of ash, ash injection into the atmosphere. I also noted that we, we can all integrate a regional array to lower the response time. The more array we get, the more data we get, the quicker we can emit the alert. And the more reliable is the, is the data we provide. And the major step we have to accomplish is to implement this in a near real time, not only um, reanalysis historic data. Thank you very much. Thank you. So since it's a coffee break, uh, we can have maybe a quick question, otherwise I invite you to go discuss with the, with the speaker if you have questions. Is there a quick question? No, thank you. So we'll restart at uh, 4.30 with uh, the last talks of, the, of T1.1. See you in half an hour.
How's your job going? You were with IT, right? Yeah. So you're changing in Paymood all the time? Yeah, we do change in the past couple of months. We're walking around in the free room. And helping. Yeah. What do you do exactly? Like, you help with CCC or if something goes wrong? Yeah, yeah. If something goes wrong, we have to take care of it. Do you study everything? Yeah. What has to do with IT or computers? They just they just, they just drop it right. Yeah, they just drop it and leave. Not too too loud. Yeah. It's thin here, but we we just are not enough people to overtake them. Yeah. 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 Here here each of these uh, sessions we did this show is like a new world. So oh yeah, so it doesn't make so yeah, it's not as heavy here. So yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So the one the one the one over there it's just heavy. Sometimes they do it in the other room, like it's, which is supposed to be here. Hello.
It shouldn't be a, a, be a lunch break, it should be a coffee break. But it's a lunch break here, wow. Double but lunch. Check, check first uh, if it's a lunch break.
Ik is zo in zijn plan. Ik ben zo in zijn plan. Ik ben zo in zijn plan. Ik hou in de telefoon. Ik heb een paar stappen gezet. Ik heb een paar stappen gezet. Oh, you got all the way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you walk uh, around with them, it's fun to just play. <laughs> this, uh, this guy is my Eastern Bandit. Yeah. Uh, I might turn them back at some point, but I know how to deal with those guys. Yep. Yeah. But the way it, it, it moves fast, it's pretty cool. It moves very fast.
His stuff is amazing. His stuff is amazing. It's amazing. Let's try out of this one. Because we have some similar races in Africa, in, in, in the, the ghost stuff, stuff, ghost stuff, yes, yeah, like ghost stuff, for example, some stuff like ah, this, yeah. in this mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is from Africa, for example. But we have the same also in Pakistan. We we have the same Kaja. Kaja. Yeah, Kaja. Where is Kaja? It's manufactured in Kaja. Yes. Ramadan is close to Afghanistan. Uh, 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 it's close to Kashmir. Kashmir, Kashmir, yeah. Kashmir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dispute mm -hmm. is close. Uh, Peshawar. is close to yes, Afghanistan. Yes, that is true, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all are like the same kind of. Mm -hmm. It must be an, an interesting uh, country. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, interesting because you are like having five provinces, yes. five uh, languages, five sort of cultures, five sort of people, mm -hmm. language, uh, their own ethnicity, their thought, uh, food, and uh, and we do have all four. Interesting now. I'm now I'm checking it. It's okay. You're just like a sandwich. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then here you have like a, the sea. It's a yeah, it's a Arabian Sea. Mm -hmm. Do find it. Do visit Pakistan. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it's too fun. You just took it and you you are in China. Here is yeah. It's uh, I was there in in uh, uh, past three years back. Mm -hmm. I had the pictures in my phone there. It was like on the border, and uh, it's like uh, the it's called uh, Pak China, mm -hmm. close to this this means an Asian country. Mm -hmm. One side, one side is uh, wrong, and I don't want to say that. Okay, I'm back. Uh, they, it's written as uh, Pak China. Uh, I think two bombs there. You can look there, mm -hmm. still, but just I guess that's not really mm -hmm. worth it. Because this is uh, this this one is. Uh, like a hill, mm -hmm. you have to go with a jeep okay. over here, and then you can have like the, 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 the map of all the countries in China. That must be interesting. It's pretty interesting. Play some coffee or uh, tea. 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 tea is still a really cool. Place. Somebody might come in half an hour to just to my just to see how it can go because it's new. Okay. Do you from our team? From the camera, the lens. Yeah, yeah, the camera. Yeah. Because all it takes is to like wait, and that's all it takes. Take ten minutes to take a picture. Mm. How our inside is look like? Okay. Mm? How inside it look like? 
Tech will want to produce the perfect uh, the perfect flavor there just to, to get the idea of it <laughs> and to see like how the market is doing things like that. Oh, okay. Because I've been doing it so good. Mm -hmm. Alright, you shall share my girlfriend. <laughs> Why? I could you stick things up and take a four hour break? No, 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 no. Why? You got to use them. You have to take it off now. Drunk? You don't sleep at night. You know? Why? So, uh, in your house, everything's turned on all the time. No, 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 no. It's nothing about the house. You're not in uh, your house. It's in your sleep at the time. So, like, the mic is in front of my throat when you put it up. Yeah, yeah. Just leave it there. This is empty. Before they have eight hour sorry, charging. Okay. You don't have to do that. Because the phone has the, the thing looks perfect. Look how long it takes. More than eight hours. No. Yes. We save the phone now. The problem is not in the phone itself. You are not in the room. You are not in the room. It's a certain location. It's all on the phone itself. I told you. Yes, but she didn't say it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, because that is what I tell you guys. Don't do anything. Don't do so over do your work. The world will be pick it up and they give it. Don't switch off and you keep doing it. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. Can I show my ears too? Yep. Your name is uh, Rashidi, and your presentation is here. No problem. Is there anything next time? So. <coughs> Thank you very much. No, 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 the thing is, you have to ask for it. Now I can ask you. Can you please not do that? I asked you, I asked you. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> no, no. So it's time uh, to start uh, again the last part of uh, our session about atmospheric dynamics. And uh, we will uh, start uh, with uh, a presentation of uh, Dr. Helen Hoshkorn uh, about temperature and wind atmospheric lidar as tools for the validation of infrasound propagation model. Okay. And uh, could you... Ça va. Je vais la présentation d'Hélène, mais il est sur... Ah, ok. Ok, thank you. 
Okay, thank you. So I am uh, Alain Oshkan from Latmos CNRS and a specialist of atmospheric dynamics on LIDAR. And uh, it's a cooperative work with uh, the team of uh, CEA uh, in the frame of the Arise project. So the, the motivation was to show if uh, we can improve the information of atmospheric dynamic from infrasound network data if we use the collocated temperature and wind profiles. So just to recall that uh, this work has been made at uh, Haute Provence Observatory, OHP, in southeast of France. So you, you see the LIDAR, and it's also an astrono astronomical site. And in this uh, site, we have two important uh, networks. We belong to two important networks. The first one is uh, ARISE. Uh, we, you have heard already about it the European project, and the second one is the NDAC, Network for Detection of Atmospheric Composition Change. It's an international net network to survey the atmospheric composition and temperature. And so uh, we have also other observations in this uh, network. So just to recall the principle of LIDAR, for those who are not familiar, we send a laser pulse in the atmosphere, and this uh, la laser light is scattered by all uh, layers in the atmosphere. This is uh, the time, and this is the altitude, and the, at the speed of the light, you can, the time between the uh, emission and the return uh, give you the altitude where the light has been scattered, and from this, you can bring some information about the structure and composition of the atmosphere. Uh, so, uh, and the first LIDAR that we use is uh, temperature measurement uh, using uh, what we call relay LIDAR. Uh, above 30 kilometers, above the stratospheric aerosol, the laser light is scattered only by air molecule, proportional to density. And from this, we can derive the temperature in absolute via value using the uh, in by integration of the hydrostatic law and the perfect gas law. And this is a nice example of a profile obtained at OHP. You can see that we can reach, we can cover the altitude range from 20 to 95 kilometers. The second LIDAR that we have at OHP is a Doppler wind LIDAR. In this case, we send a monochromatic uh, laser pulse. And if there is some wind, the, the light is shifted and using uh, very, very narrow uh, filter with a double-edged filter. We, we can uh, derive the, the Doppler shift and that is proportional to the wind. And this is an uh, example of uh, profile of the obtained recently. You see that we can cover the altitude range from 5 to 75 kilometers. And you see the, uh, day-to-day -day variabilities that we obtain with this LIDAR uh, in January of this year. So uh, first I will sh speak about uh, gravity waves that are formed above uh, when the wind is blowing above mountains. So uh, th these uh, gravity waves have periods from uh, five minutes, the brand VCA frequency, up to 17 hours for our latitude, the Coriolis uh, period. And the main source are, of course, orography above, above mountains, but also deep convection and jet stream uh, instabilities. So, but here we will look more on the orographic waves. So, at the same time, at 2HP, we have the experimental infrasound network from CEA. And from this, we can observe mountain infrasonic waves that are also uh, created by the wind blowing above mountains, but with a different uh, frequency range between, uh, let's say, 10 to 100 seconds. And uh, the characteristic of this web, because they are low frequency infrasound, they, they are very, uh, not attenuated and can travel at long distances, maybe several thousands of kilometers, and also, uh, 
they can go uh, in all directions because uh, using the thermospheric uh, guide. And uh, of course, the, the two phenomena, gravity waves and uh, mountain waves, are uh, related to the wind above mountains. But the link between uh, gravity waves and, uh, and uh, infrasound uh, mountain wave needs to be studied in more detail because the direct link is not uh, clearly understood at this time. So it's one of our, our work in, at OHP. So beginning of January, we were in a very interesting situation with high, with high pressure above the uh, uh, ocean, uh, low pressure east of France, and with a very strong uh, north, north wind. And uh, if you look at the location of OHP here, we have mountains both on north and east. We have the Alps here. With, uh, and then uh, when the wind is blowing from, from north, we can have a lot of orographic waves. And you see that the wind, uh, this is meridional wind. The wind was uh, from north at all altitude from the ground up to 30 kilometers. Very favorable to propagation of gravity waves up to the stratosphere. So you see in this observation on 6 January, on both wind and uh, temperature observation, that we have a stationary structure indicating the presence of uh, stationary waves in both uh, profile, temperature and wind profile, with, uh, as expected when you have uh, orographic waves. And also uh, another example uh, two days after, you see very well this structure with a detailed uh, fluctuation, but a, a very stationary structure, and interesting temperature profile with uh, some layers close to the adiabatic left threads. This indicates that in these layers, we can have uh, instabilities, like you can see this, and breaking of waves. So it was a very interesting uh, orographic uh, wave event. So at the s during the same period, uh, uh, from, uh, you see here the detection of uh, infrasound with uh, uh, array. And uh, if we, uh, here this is due to the oceanic swell coming from west. But uh, for, uh, long, uh, for low frequency, this is mainly related to mountain waves. And you see here in uh, December, January, events of uh, uh, mountain waves with uh, azimuth from north to east here, from the region where we have mountains. And this is a zoom of the, this figure. And you see very well here uh, the presence of mountain waves here and here from 25 of December to 12 of January. And in red, you have, uh, in fact, the detection of Etna eruption. And during this period, we had uh, a wind speed. This is uh, the wind at 2,000 meters, about the height of the mountain around. Uh, wind speed uh, from radio sounding. We speak of more than 20 meters per second. And wind direction from northwest at the beginning to more uh, in, uh, north after. So favorable to have uh, waves above mountains. So, uh, so th in this period, we can say that we have uh, azimuth from north to east and, uh, and uh, periods from northwest to north of a strong wind. So now, uh, using this uh, data, we have compared uh, here the, what we expect for the propagation of infrasound. So uh, here we use the LiDAR data. Uh, in the top panel here, we have the zonal wind in red and the meridional wind in blue. And the full line represents the LiDAR observation and the dotted line, the ECMWF uh, forecast, and you see that uh, 
for both components, we have strong uh, disagreement between the LiDAR and TCMWF. For instance, here, uh, we have a peak of wind at 50 kilometers that is 80 meters per second from the LiDAR and only 50 meters per second in the model. So there is a strong bias in the model and also for the meridional component. And it is the same for temperature where we have already a, a disagreement around the, trop the stratopause, but also a strong bias in the mesosphere. And when we use this data to compute the effective uh, sound speed ratio, uh, so when it is bit, uh, larger than one, we can have a propagation, and when this is uh, lower, we, we cannot have. So, of course, with this strong uh, wind, we have both... Uh, this is from the LiDAR data, and this is from ECWF uh, data. In both cases, we can have a propagation from the, in the direction from uh, south to west. But if you look at the values, the ratio is much higher here with the LiDAR, more than 1.2, almost 1.3 in the center. Then uh, with the CMWF, it's only 1.1. Also, the, the minimum is stronger in LiDAR than in the CMWF. So it means that we can have uh, large uh, errors if you use, we are using only CMWF uh, analysis. And uh, of course, if we can have uh, LiDAR data at the site of the uh, infrasound station, the, the prediction for uh, propagation will be much better. So I will conclude my talk that uh, the synergy between the colocated observation of uh, microbarometers array and uh, LiDAR brings new information on the metal atmospheric dynamic. And the temperature and wind LiDAR profiles in the middle atmosphere help to understand the atmospheric propagation of infrasounds. And also, uh, we observe uh, orographic gravity waves and mountain waves in this station, both generated by the wind blowing above mountain. But we need further study to understand really the link between the two phenomena. And uh, this work was supported by uh, the European Commission through the ERISE uh, uh, H2020 project, and also uh, with the support of CNRS, CEA, and uh, the CNES, uh, French uh, Space Agency. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Is there any questions? Yes. Yeah. An ECMWF can be significantly yeah. different. Uh, what range in terms of percentage did you observe? Maybe I have to start. Uh, the ratio was, uh, uh, the maximum ratio was 1.3 with the LiDAR and 1.15 with the ECMWF. I mean, I was interested, if, of if you have developed some statistics, I mean, what is the No, it was uh, just uh, an example during this very perturbed period. We need to do more statistics on this. Thank you. Okay, another question? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, if you show the figure earlier, I, after 30 kilometer, it's not very accurate. It's shift the, your radar from the, uh, yeah. the other measurement. Okay, I want to understand what the minimum detection limit, at what height you can... Of the LiDAR? Of the LiDAR, yeah, exactly. And what's the, the maximum is 30, as we see from the figure. No, so, the minimum. with this system, we... I can say that the accurate observations are above 25 kilometers, but we are developing uh, other channels for the LiDAR uh, using Raman scattering, and we expect to go from uh, almost the ground to, to the thermosphere. So we will uh, fill the gap for lower altitude. Uh. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's time now to, um, to move to next presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Al-Rajidi.
uh, the effect of the atmospheric boundary layer on the detected radionuclide in Kuwait. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mufrah Rashidi. I'm from Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research. Uh, this work has been uh, done in, in, in to know the, understand the effect of the atmospheric boundary layer in Kuwait and see how this boundary layer or the measurement of the upper meteorology can help us to understand the detected radionuclide at the surface level. <coughs> My talk, I will start to give an overview about the weather condition in Kuwait. Then I will uh, show the upper air MTP uh, five meteorological temperature profile that the device we use it to predict the temperature. <coughs> then the measurements of the beryllium seven as a natural isotopes with the uh, cesium 137 as an anthropogenic radionuclide detected at the AMS station in Kuwait, which is KP40. <clears throat> then I will end up with the finding the correlation between the, the, the detected radionuclide at the surface level with the, with the effect of the temperature at the upper la layer on the atmosphere. <clears throat> uh, this picture is the showing the, the weather of Kuwait, actually. The, the Kuwait, you can see, this is the Kuwait. This arrow showing the prevailing wind direction in Kuwait. Normally, it's prevailing northwesterly direction. Is the north is the uh, the the weather mostly characterized or the climate which is characterized the country which is Kuwait. It's typical dry desert climate, which involve the deposition and resuspensions of atmospheric particulate or even the sand and the dust which is settled down. This picture actually shown during the dust storm when it's happening in Kuwait and this is the country but not mean all the time it is dusty no we have a lovely weather sometimes or most of the time but these are the event of the dust <coughs> uh, this is the temperature the typical temperature in Kuwait you can see here this is the monthly variation and I put the maximum and the minimum we can reach up to 50 degrees Celsius, 50, 51 degrees Celsius in, in the mid of June or July. <coughs> uh, that means it's harsh weather in, in summer. This is the, also the, the, the wind rose blot, which is I show you that the, most of the wind coming from this, this direction. And this is the study done by our colleague regarding the number of the dust storm in Kuwait for the year 2010 till 2017. And we can see here the month of March and May, this, the season which is, we call it in our country, Sarayat, they have most, the, most of the event of the number of the dust storm recorded. <coughs> Here is the measurement site that we are uh, going to show the result of. Here is the MTB5. This is the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research. This is the RM40 station. Is the CTPTO station where we're, we collect the data and the MTB5 uh, station. MTB5 uh, with a meteorological station. This is actually we put it in the top of the building. This is my picture in. National, the national dress, uh, dress, and this is my colleague also here sitting with us. We, we, this is the first time we use this meteorological caliber file in this region, actually. <coughs> and this is the CTBTO RM40 station, which is beside here. So it is reasonable to compare this <coughs> result because the site is near to each other. The principle of the MTB temperature profiler 
is based on the microwave, as you see in here, is the microwave, microwave, and it is sending the signal of the microwave to the azimuthic angle through the atmosphere to get the temperature, different temperatures. The technique is based on the thermal radiation of the atmospheric at the center of the molecule of the oxygens <coughs> and the five nanometers. Uh, the, this also to give us the profile for the temperature as you go. Uh, our colleague, he showed us the LADAR system. The LADAR system is give you the temperature profile at minimum one kilometer or five kilometer and above sometimes. So this one, it's show you from the 50 meter, the ground level, which is the lower layer of the atmosphere where most of the transport phenomena happen. <clears throat> this is the typical uh, temperature profile in Kuwait. This is in 13 August. I, we present this in August and this is in mid of the day. And you can see that at zero level, which is the top of the building, it's 45 degree Celsius. And as we go up, normally the temperatures go down. And this is the different levels. We can see here at the, at the between the hour 14 to 18, we have uh, un st very stable, uh, unsta uh, unstable condition. That's the transport of the pollutants will be more mixed. But here we have a stable condition where the temperature at the lower layer will be cooler than the, <coughs> uh, cooler than the upper layers. <coughs> Here is the just most of the phenomena regarding the uh, s uh, stability. This is the adiabatic lab rates. This is the condition where this the measurements showing unstable layer. That's with, which is favor for the for, for favor for the transport and dilution of the pollutants. Here, when we have something called service inversion, when the temperature at the bottom of the or the low level is high, <coughs> higher than the top of them. So this is mechanism made the pollutant to be trapped. <clears throat> and this is the other type, which is, we call it elevated inversion. It's a start like very stable, uh, unstable condition, and then it's go to the stable condition. The layer here, we can see it, the, the surface inversion layer up to 700 meter, and that the elevated inversion start from this layer, which is 100 up to 600. And we are trying to see how is this effect. This is the frequency, actually. Now, this is the frequency of the number or the frequency of the service inversion. This is the service inversion in the blue. We can see it in the summer is very high, while the elevated inversion, it's in the summer, is very low. I would like to show you also the, the, the idea is to link this measurements with the detected radionuclide seed. This is actually, I changed it yesterday to show that these are the data, to, to, to tell you how is the measurements of the beryllium in Kuwait compared to the other, to the other stations. <clears throat> I select Kuwait, RM40 station, in Germany, which is far away a little bit here, also some station in Russia, and some Rus station in Africa, just to see how's, what's happening now. We can see the station in Kuwait have the high beryllium level compared to the other stations and it is also the highest beryllium level among all the IMS stations. And this is case us to study why this level is high, why we don't have any active uh, 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 nuclear activity in that area. <coughs> also in the case of the cesium detected compared to the other stati stations, we are higher in the detection time also at the, at the level. And this is case the questions, what is the main effect? Is it the dust storm? Is it the something happened in the atmosphere that kills us? This is the scientific question we try to answer here and explain. <coughs> uh, this is actually the, the, the results of the effect of the inversion. When we compare the measurements now with the different effect of the inversion, especially the, 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 the height of the inversion. We can see in a monthly basis, 
that this is the this is the top of the surface inversion, what the height of the top of the surface inversion, this this side, and this is the the bottom of the elevated inversion, and this is the beryllium seven. We can see that beryllium seven is almost correlated with the with the top of the surface inversion. When the surface inversion very high, the 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 the, detect, the detected radionuclei, which is beryllium seven. It become very high, especially in the summer. And you can see, this is these are the months in the summer. While when we go to the picture, which is we show the dust storm event, it was high in May. And this station is particulated. It should be, my, it should be logically that we will have it in, because dust storm going to the station, we will detect it more. But here we see that the effect of the inversion is clearly appear. The same, the same figure that I showed, but it's in the book's blots. This is now the cesium, actually. The cesium is show the opposite. When, and it's follow the, uh, uh, the bottom of the elevated inversion, not the surface inversion. Because when the inversion is high, the turbulence is more and case the dust, which is settled down around the Sahara, come to the station and detect it. <clears throat> uh, finally, uh, my conclusion that this is the, the ground base inversion major, measurements used by the MTP5. And this is a study where strongly in summer, and we see that in summer we have more frequently inversion happen earlier than the study which is drawn by the SODAR or even LADAR, uh, because it is different techniques. And this is give the lower type of the atmosphere. Uh, the height of the elevated inversion are more significant effect in the dispersion of the pollutants and detected by the mixing height. The height and the frequency both, when the frequency is high, when the height is very also high, the, the red nucleus, especially the natural isotopes, it's look more higher. And the opposite side, the, 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 the one which is <coughs> Uh, uh, anthropogenic, it's become lower. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Is there any question? Thank you very much. So I think we'll uh, move on to the last presenter of the day, who is my co-chair, uh, Dr. Blanc. And uh, Dr. Blanc will talk about uncertainties in numerical weather forecasting models on infrasound simulation observed by the ARISE project. Yes, thank you, Pierrick. <coughs> so, um, this work uh, was performed in the framework of the ARISE project. This is collaborative work, as you can see. We have uh, many people uh, working on uh, this uh, topic, and uh, this work uh, concerned uh, all the ARISE team, in fact. <coughs> Uh, and uh, I will uh, start uh, presenting uh, the effect of the variability of the middle atmosphere, which is at the origin of the uncertainties in infrasound monitoring uh, simulation. Uh, Arise, uh, I will present the RISE project, uh, which is a multi-instrument observation, uh, including infrasound IMS system, but with a complementary instrument. And I will show uh, how we can improve the representation of disturbances in weather and climate model, as well as in infrasound routine simulation, thanks to this uh, new data set. Alors, at first, uh, we use the International Infrasound Monitoring System. Uh, you can see it here uh, with uh, 51 certified stations today and uh, 30, uh, uh, 60 when uh, the network will be completed. And uh, they provide relevant global observation of most uh, the atmospheric disturbances. And this is opportunity to calibrate the network using a well-identified source and promote civil and scientific application. And, uh, but uh, infrasound uh, propagate uh, over uh, a very large distance uh, because they are ducted in the stratospheric uh, wave guide of the atmosphere and the long range propagation is controlled by the stratospheric wind uh, which are inverted with the season and with the hemisphere. 
and we proposed uh, the RISE project. Uh, it is this H2020 um, uh, project uh, um, funded by the European Commission. And uh, so uh, the idea was uh, to, uh, uh, to establish a unique atmospheric research uh, infrastructure in uh, Europe, and it combines uh, complementary observation uh, with uh, infrasound observation completed by uh, LIDAR and by uh, also uh, meteor radar and other uh, radar uh, to have uh, uh, observation in different uh, altitudes. And, uh, the, and we use also uh, theoretical and modeling uh, studies uh, to better understand and describe the dynamics of the middle and upper atmosphere. And uh, the idea is uh, to uh, better describe uh, this, uh, this uh, system here, uh, where uh, you see uh, that uh, the large disturbances are produced at low altitude by wind over mountain, volcano, cyclone, thunderstorm. And they are, uh, um, uh, there is a forcing in uh, the stratosphere and mesosphere, and large scale disturbances in, uh, in uh, this uh, region of the atmosphere. Uh, which uh, influence also uh, troposphere and the uh, weather at the ground surface. And uh, so we compare uh, uh, the uh, LIDAR observation at first uh, with uh, ICMWF, uh, the European Center of Medium Range Weather Forecast, uh, which uh, this is atmospheric model used for the simulation of uh, infrasound. And uh, uh, so uh, this is this figure, the temperature profile are uh, compared, and uh, we see that the difference exceeds uh, 10 K in the upper atmosphere, at stratosphere, and even more in the mesosphere at altitude higher uh, than uh, um, uh, 50, uh, 50, uh, pardon, uh, 50 kilometers. <coughs> And uh, so these differences are uh, very large. And uh, here I show some case studies uh, uh, observed in a different station in my observatory in tropics in Alomar in uh, Norway, in northern Norway. And uh, you see here uh, the large difference between ICMWF, which is in blue, and uh, uh, which is in blue here, and uh, the observation here. And uh, this is uh, for a double stratospheric jet structure for uh, gravity waves also. You see that differences are very large. The differences are higher than 20 meters per second for, for the wind. And during stratospheric event, we can have uh, differences up to 40 degrees. <coughs> And the stratospheric warming are uh, important uh, disturbances in, uh, in uh, the stratosphere. As you can see, the uh, stratosphere is uh, very disturbed. And uh, they are characterized by uh, polar vortex breaking and the inversion of the zonal stratospheric wind uh, and of the infrasound propagation direction because the wave guide is inverted. And uh, this example uh, was obtained um, by, uh, by NORSAR uh, with a Norway uh, station. And uh, you see uh, this is uh, observation of a microbarome waves uh, uh, formed by uh, ocean swell. And we observe that every, every time in uh, the infrasound station. And you see that uh, uh, we observed uh, swell from the Atlantic up to the stratospheric warming event uh, here. And uh, uh, you see the effect of the inversion of the wind because uh, during the stratospheric warming event, we received uh, uh, infrasound from the Pacific. And uh, so, but uh, these kind of events are uh, now uh, very well identified by uh, LIDAR. And the their effect of infrasound propagation can be determined in, and uh, we start to include it in the simulation. And but uh, this uh, st sudden stratospheric warming event are uh, very important for uh, numerical weather pre prediction uh, because uh, here uh, in uh, this uh, in uh, this figure here uh, you see uh, for uh, 15 sudden stratospheric warming events the difference in temperature and uh, in uh, the precipitation uh, produced uh, uh, up to. Uh, 
15 to 60 days after the onset of the certain stratospheric warming event. And you see that uh, it's, uh, the, uh, the temperature at the ground is colder in Europe and warmer in the uh, US. And uh, this is something uh, representative and uh, repetitive for all the stratospheric warming event. And so in Europe, when we have a stratospheric warming event, it's called uh, several weeks after the event. So it's important to better determine that in uh, the prediction model. And uh, so this, uh, this uh, figure uh, what, what, what was provided by Meteo France uh, using uh, numerical weather prediction model. And uh, you see here uh, that uh, in blue, uh, this is uh, um, the anomaly which appear in the prediction model of, uh, during the st sudden stratospheric warming event. In fact, the number of available routine observation of wind in the stratosphere and above is very small for assimilation in the model, and this is the reason why they are uh, not very well represented in the forecasting. Uh, but other data are uh, requested also uh, to improve the model. This concerns low latitude, high altitude, and other small scale disturbances such as the chart, uh, uh, gravity waves. And the rise data are relevant for the description of these disturbances. We are not yet integrated in the model. And uh, there is a large potential of the IMS for gravity wave observation uh, because, uh, you, as you see here in the spectrum, uh, it's possible to observe the infrasound. Uh, this is uh, used uh, routinely in, 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 um, for uh, infrasound monitoring, but we observed also in a low frequency gravity wave, planetary waves, and uh, solar tides, which is important for a better knowledge of the dynamics of the atmosphere. And uh, this uh, figure here uh, was uh, produced by BGR, and uh, this uh, shows uh, the um, uh, mountain uh, uh, infrasound waves observed by the infrasound technology using a cross-bearing approach. And uh, we see here uh, mountain waves uh, very well represented uh, with a large activity in South America and also uh, on uh, the high mountain in uh, Tibet. Uh, and uh, these uh, waves uh, are at the origin of uncertainties in uh, the ICMWF model. And uh, you see here at a uh, larger scale uh, during several years uh, that we have also some uh, uh, specific uh, structure. And uh, this is a zoom, zoom here. And uh, you see that uh, this uh, structure uh, fluctuates uh, during uh, several days. And uh, this is always a microbarome. And uh, these uh, fluctuations are produced by the effect of the planetary waves. Planetary waves, uh, this is uh, larger scale than gravity waves. And uh, this is fluctuation uh, over uh, several days. And uh, this, uh, why is that interesting? This is interesting because uh, this kind of uh, waves impact uh, also the infrasound propagation. Uh, they are expected to be larger in winter, but uh, such observation at the global scale are relevant for weather and climate model because they can affect the general circulation in the uh, stratosphere and mesosphere. And uh, we try here uh, to compare uh, uh, planetary waves observation by LIDAR in uh, Argentina, where uh, infra, uh, LIDAR station is in operation uh, uh, for uh, more than one year now. And uh, this is portable LIDAR, uh, very, uh, very efficient and uh, with high quality data. And uh, so uh, this is a comparison uh, uh, of observation in red with SMWF data. Uh, for period uh, up to 50 days and more. And uh, what you can see here is, is, is uh, that there is a difference between observation and uh, LIDAR and, and, uh, and model. And uh, this was uh, uh, the first time I think that uh, we are doing this kind of work. And uh, you see that in summer and in winter, the difference between uh, SMWF and observation is not the same. This is larger in summer. And so uh, the, uh, this means that uh, planetary waves are not always very well represented probably in SMWF and that uh, our data can provide relevant observation even in this frequency range, uh, which is uh, quite uh, interesting. 
um, because uh, uh, planetary wave contribute to change in wind and temperature and impact global atmospheric uh, circulation. And uh, this can be interesting for a cl climate uh, model to have this kind of observation. And so, uh, conclusion and perspective, and uh, the atmosphere is a highly variable environment and small scale disturbances uh, affect the infrasound propagation and need to be integrated in routine monitoring tools. And we have shown that the IMS infrasound network provides unique global observation about these disturbances, and this is quite relevant to determine uh, uh, their effect in, um, in infrasound modeling and uh, in uh, ISMWF model. Uh, the perspective of the horizon now are the following. Uh, we uh, would like to improve observation by uh, using the synergy between infrasound and LIDAR observation, both uh, for ICMWF model assessment and uh, event improvement, and also in routine infrasound simulation. We miss information about uh, disturbances in uh, the stratosphere, and LIDAR uh, it's a good way to obtain uh, this kind of observation. And the second objective is to develop a near uh, real-time processing, which is needed for uh, societal applications that are as remote volcano monitoring, as shown by uh, Thibault Arnal previously, and, uh, at, and also assimilation in uh, SMWF model. And also, we plan to extend uh, the coverage in space and in altitude, and provide the data from ground to near air space to go at higher altitude, which can be relevant also for the model. Thanks for attention. So thank you very much. Is there any question? So maybe since we are just a couple of minutes in advance, maybe you, you want to say what about what will be uh, the future of Horizon rise because uh, you said that uh, mm. this is uh, this yes. is over i can uh, I said. yes uh, so we prepare as you see uh, we prepare uh, the next project Arise uh, uh, now and the design study phase and uh, we had uh, two projects funded by the european commission Arise uh, one and Arise two during uh, six years and uh, now uh, we de uh, determine uh, the feasibility of the concept and uh, we prepare the next project, which will be integrating activity project. It will be submitted to the European Commission in March uh, next year. And uh, so we try uh, to uh, have uh, new challenges in uh, the project and uh, the, the, uh, the near real time processing, I think uh, will be quite important for the future of the project. Um, because uh, we will have a direct observ observation of the disturbances and uh, this is needed for uh, ISMWF uh, uh, model to have a direct observation of, uh, the, of what happened in the atmosphere, in stratosphere, and this could be very useful to better understand uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the prevision. Good. So thank you very much. So if there's no more questions, then it concludes the T1.1. Uh, so uh, what will be coming next will be the poster preview in this room, but since uh, we, can, we are just concluding the T1.1, I just want to thank all the speakers and uh, the poster presenters. The posters are still upstairs, so if, you, uh, if some of you uh, want to see the posters and if the poster presenters are, are willing, that uh, we can still uh, have a look at it. And uh, I just want to tell also the poster presenters that the, the posters have to be removed today after, uh, after 1815, after 1830. So yes, and otherwise they will be uh, removed because tomorrow we'll have a, another display. And the last thing is don't forget to vote for your, if you uh, liked uh, a poster preview or poster uh, that you have seen in the session or one of the talk from, uh, that, uh, that we had today in the 11 talk that we had in this, uh, in this session. Thank you very much. So where's the microphone? Uh, it's...
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you have a poster preview for session T2.4, uh, then uh, please uh, come closer. Um, in the system, the, there is uh, 34 uh, poster preview uploaded. So we uh, only present those uh, uh, for those people who are here. So please come closer and we try to organize this. Hello, uh, my poster is about aerosol dynamics and dispersion of radioactive particles. I work with dispersion modeling and we wanted to find out the impact of including more advanced aerosol dynamics into dispersion modeling. So we included or we did tests with an advanced uh, model to uh, simulate the result of including advanced aerosol dynamics. When you <coughs> traditionally we only look at dry deposition and wet deposition, but we included coagulation, condensation, and other aerosol dynamics, and we saw that in 5% of all these cases that we tried, over 100,000 cases, we have a difference in air concentration of about 50%, which makes it very important to analyze this further, because what we're looking at is singular real realization of something hazardous coming out of the out to the atmosphere. Please come and see the poster, and I will talk to it in more detail. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm a postgraduate student at University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, in my poster, focus on the data collected and analyzed from IMA station TZP64 located in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Um, there you will see um, the activity concentration trend of radionuclides before and after background subtraction. I did that in order to see if there is any contribution of background concentration in the radionuclides. Also, since the atmosphere is, is always dynamic, and we expect the pollutants to be varied from time to time, for that reason, I have uh, investigated the influence of meteorological parameters to the activity concentration. Welcome to my posters. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hello. This poster is about atmospheric source localization methods. So it's a simple approach of just counting overlapping SRS fields for two basic cases. One is multiple detections of a single release, as you see on the left, which is for the ruthenium episode in October 2017 with detections all over Europe and parts of the Northern Hemisphere. And the other is for repeating emitters, which are measured constantly or regularly at, at the German radionuclide station DEC 33, where overlapping the fields fixed to the transport pines uh, time coincides over the IRE Fluoris facility. Thank you. Thank and you, you won't, won't see things moving on the poster. <laughs> so, Hello, so my name is Andy Delclos, and uh, I will present uh, work of my colleague uh, Peter de Meuter, who is now uh, at, uh, in Canada, at Health Canada. And uh, basically what we are doing is uh, he amused himself a little bit with uh, the inverse modeling applied to the xenon backgrounds. So we had a huge data set of, uh, of CNL of, on xenon, and we also could use a lot of detections and non-detections, which is very important. Also the non-detections from the MS stations, like you can see here. And uh, we, we had 36 uh, case studies. And uh, then we didn't have to reinvent the wheel again. And here we used the, the modeling tool of uh, PTS by using the source receptor sensitivities made available. 
And last but not least, then uh, the idea was to find the source term by minimizing the cost function and the beautiful formula on the quasi-Newton technique, you will have to go to my poster. And uh, that's about it. So if you want to, the, you see here the highlight where you can see the final result as the average of all the uh, simulations. And of course, not surprisingly, we are quite close to where we have the source, of course. So thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, if we don't have any more uh, volunteers to present a poster preview, then uh, I invite all of you to see a real posters. Uh, and thank you very much. And please remember to vote for your best poster preview, for your best oral uh, presentation, and for, for the best poster. Thank you.
going by and attending the closer and closer to our center since we have the evening access to each of the five. Oh, okay. Man, I really like that place. It's amazing. Um, so it's perfect. It's so good. Um, yeah, I think this is one we'll just definitely stop by every now and then. But there's still a lot more going on than there has been yet. Um, Where's our, uh, okay. All right, for everybody that has stayed this long, it is worth your wait. So we're gonna do the uh, poster session uh, previews with uh, enabling uh, technologies topic 4.3. Um, we have a number of posters that are hanging, but we have two of the authors representing to do their one minute poster slams. So uh, without further ado, we can get into these and then uh, what we'll do is we'll encourage the authors to stand by their posters immediately after this as we still have a bit of an evening uh, program as, as much as everybody's availability. So with that, gentlemen. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Greg Klein from GDMS. Uh, 
So recently on some roster revalidations, we had a couple of different flow errors and we wanted to actually investigate what was going on. Um, it turned out that the turbulent intensity across both the profile of the duct and over the ranges of flow um, basically responded a lot more chaotically than we assumed. So uh, we built an in-house test rig and I did a bunch of software to kind of split up the different sources of error and um, basically try and figure out what's going on. And we've worked on some flow conditioning and uh, improved methods for revalidation using a semi-autonomous system that I set up. Um, feel free to stop by my booth after my poster gets taken down tonight. Um, we're gonna be here all week. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Bonneau. I am uh, covering for some of my colleagues who couldn't end up coming f to the S&T. This is about NDC in the cloud, an example of using uh, cloud technologies for, for performing seismic processing in the cloud. Uh, so we can, that can be used to do massive seismic analysis through a web browser. Uh, so what they did was um, Jonathan McCarthy and Omar Marcio and others uh, used the cloud to analyze um, the US array data for tonal noise background and did this with Amazon Web Services and used a variety of, of uh, nodes in, uh, in the cloud. Uh, it shows an example, and this was done for about $120 per day and done over a few days of analysis time uh, with uh, the cooperation of IRIS uh, in the United States. And so you can come by and we can discuss part of this, but it turned out quite well and quite efficient. So, thanks. All right, that concludes the poster slam. Um, vote, vote once, but not often, but Vote for your favorite. I think the, the voting remains open. And again, um, if our, po our poster authors are willing, they would uh, possibly attend their posters immediately after this. And uh, I thank everybody. Good. Right.